Hello everyone, thanks for joining us. Um, this is the November event of our Scholars Library series and each month this initiative allows a scholar to come and talk about their literary works to those directly in the community and beyond. Uh, since its conception over, over 18 months ago now, um, this series has grown in popularity. So for those of you who've been here before, you might think that this looks a little different, but we're trying out the webinar functionality of Zoom uh, to better manage the event and also allow more people to join. So if you have been here before and you have any thoughts or feedback afterwards on the format you like, um, I'd love to hear it. Um, but thank you for coming um, and it's nice to have you with us. Uh, today, we're really excited to welcome Jeremy to talk about his book, Every Life is on Fire. Scholar in Residence, Samantha O'Sullivan, is here to moderate the conversation today. Sam's currently reading for a DPhil in theoretical physics, and her research applies algorithmic information theory to the evolution of biological systems. Uh, Sam's also deeply curious about the intersections of physics and theology, so I'm really looking forward to hearing from both Sam and Jeremy today uh, on this topic. Uh, so without further ado, I'll hand over to Samantha, who'll give you a further introduction to Jeremy and the session itself, and we can get into it. Um, if you've got any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A feature, um, and we can get to those towards the end of the session. Um, but over to you, Sam. Great, thanks, Georgie. Um, so I'm really excited for this talk today. Um, I'll start with a brief introduction. So Jeremy uh, was Rhodes, New Hampshire, and St. John's, 2003. He's a theoretical physicist who got his start uh, in my alma mater as well at Harvard, um, where he studied some biology, um, and then he now lives, uh, he started in the Boston area, he's a native of New England, uh, came to Stanford to study theoretical physics, um, and he worked as a professor at MIT, which is where he developed these ideas we'll be talking about today of dissipative adaptation, he talked about in his book, um, and he works at the boundary of biology and physics now as a professor at Bari Lawn University. Um, so really excited to have you today, uh, Jeremy, and I should also Add, he was ordinated as an Orthodox rabbi, so really excited to talk about some of the intersections um, of your work in physics and also um, in the study of the Torah. So uh, I want to give you the opportunity uh, to start by asking about the motivation of this book. Um, so in your first chapter of the book, Staff and Stink, you write that we didn't know any physics when we invented the word life, and it would be strange if physics only now began dictating what the word means. So what can we gain from defining life's boundaries in the language of physics? And what were your motivations in attempting to do so in this book? Thanks very much. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to have this opportunity to participate in this discussion. I appreciate the invitation and the warm introduction. Uh, so I guess at a high level, originally at some level, my motivation for writing the book clearly came from having reached a point in the development of a research program uh, or let's say a program of theoretical research uh, within my lab then at MIT where there were some ideas and we thought they were making some sense and we were already publishing about them in a, in a technical setting. Um, and it seemed like they were ideas that a broader audience might find interesting. And so I think it, it reached the point where it seemed like it would be nice to try to set some of the ideas down in a way that would make the discussion more broadly accessible, especially because I think it actually is a topic that lends itself to that more than some maybe more technical subjects in mathematical physics or something like that. Um, and so at some level, it's just the desire to you know write a book for the general public about some scientific research. However, clearly it's it's a little bit atypical uh, as such a book goes, because uh, in addition to being about physics, I also uh, wanted to make the book be about the kind of broader wrapping of ideas that the subject sits in, uh, meaning that if you're talking about the boundary between life and non-life, you know, possibly about the origins of life, that's a very hard subject to pick up without evoking questions that extend outside the narrow bounds of what you think of as scientific inquiry, because people are interested in these questions for reasons that have to do with things like, you know, what is the meaning of being a living thing? Um, and, you know, how do we understand what science is telling us about the world and what that does or doesn't tell us about what other kinds of commentaries or traditions about the past tell us about our origins, et cetera. And, and I, 
I think particularly because I myself, uh, as you mentioned, have a great interest in studying the Torah, you know, the, the texts of uh, the Jewish tradition, the Hebrew Bible, uh, the Talmud and things like that, and trying to make sense of, you know, what they're trying to uh, teach. I am quite aware that there are different ways of asking or talking about, you know, some of these questions. And I, I didn't want to kind of sweep that under the rug. So the next step in conceiving of the book was to say, okay, if I'm going to write about the physics, I want to write about it in a way where if you're just interested in the physics, then it's there for you. But I want to put it in a wrapping that makes it clear that I have a, a broader discussion that I want to situate this in. And I'll draw from the sources that I trust for that and the tradition that I'm connected to. And so that was the the overarching motivation. Uh, and so it's it's kind of this you know, uh, one-two punch where there's chapters about physics and epilogues or sort of postscripts for each chapter that are a bit more uh, trying to connect to uh, ideas, mostly from this one passage in the book of Exodus. Um, but then that passage in the book of Exodus, I think what also ended up happening was that I, I was doing the scientific research for a long time. And then when I started asking myself, well, how would I try to situate my discussion of this in terms that you know reach for those sources and that tradition and, and situated more broadly, I realized there was this passage in the book of Exodus, which is the moment when Moses is at the burning bush and there are these signs that God gives to him that he's supposed to bring to the Israelites, one of which is turning a staff into a serpent, for example, where it suddenly seemed clear that this whole passage was very interested in the subject of the boundary between life and non-life, uh, that you have as I mentioned, a, an inanimate staff that turns into a living servant. That's kind of obvious, a transition from life to non-life. And then there's this also this kind of snowy anomaly that appears on the skin of Moses. And so your skin is the boundary of you. And so skin is also a boundary between life and non-life. Uh, and snow is itself a kind of fractal, ambiguous boundary that you can see with your eye if you look closely. Uh, and so it's all about the sort of ambiguity of that boundary. And then the last sign is pouring the blood of the Nile on the dry ground and it turning to blood. And so again, you have this transition from more basic building materials into something that is the essence of life. So you suddenly notice, wow, all of these things are about, you know, the boundary between life and non-life seemingly. So what's that about? And I, I became very curious just, you know, exegetically or, or sort of as a matter of interpretive investigation to look into the text and see why it was engaging with the subject uh, and was very gratified to find that it, it seemed to really contain some profound connections uh, that, that paralleled some of the conceptual progress we had to make on the scientific side. So it just seemed like, okay, talk about both these things together uh, and, and start the whole discussion that way. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for that introduction. I'm really excited to go in more depth and later in the talk into some of those, uh, some of that biblical imagery and then the scientific kind of um, examples that parallel them. And I kind of want to start by talking just about the title of the book. So Every Life is on Fire uh, comes from this line in the book where you say, far from a random disassembling influence, the environment to which every organism is adapted is integral to it. In this sense, every life is on fire, wreathed in that familiar flame, which helped coax it into being. Um, so for some background for people who may not read, this is sort of the pinnacle of you explaining a, this theory of dissipative adaptation and how systems of particles adapt their structures to be better at dissipating energy. Um, so I wanted to ask if you could kind of briefly explain this concept of dissipative adaptation, what your research in it looks like right now, and then what direction do you see um, some of this research going in the future? Sure. So the basic idea with dissipative adaptation I think is maybe easiest to illustrate relative to a simpler example of how physicists and in particular statistical physicists explain organization that they see in the world. So if you're a physicist or a thermodynamicist who's thinking about like ice forming and, and making a crystal out of water, then when you think about the molecular structure of water, when it forms a solid phase, when it forms ice, uh, it's very orderly, and if you thought about how likely it would be that a bunch of randomly bouncing around pieces of something would arrange themselves into a very regular order, uh, it would seem like that's very unlikely. It's sort of like flipping a coin and getting heads a quadrillion times in a row. But of course, that's too naive an account of 
how ice forms. Really, what we understand about ice forming is that although it's true that every molecule is kind of randomly jiggling around, and if they're jiggling violently enough, then they're going to form a liquid and all kind of tumble around and stay jumbling and tumbling forever. Once things cool down enough, the jiggling is kind of weak. And then there are these attractive forces between the water molecules where they kind of like to fit together, not just close together, but in particular orientations. Uh, and so they end up forming this sort of network of uh, hydrogen bonds that forms a particular organized structure. And that's explained by the attractive forces between the water molecules. So that's what's called organization that can come from non-equilibrium self-organization, sorry, excuse me, equilibrium self-organization um, in statistical thermodynamics. So it's just about the trade-off between it's hot, so you're jiggling a lot, and maybe some attractive forces that want to hold you together and organize you. And if it gets cool enough, then the attractive forces win and you organize. Living things are not explainable in those terms because they are not the result of just a bunch of attractive interactions between their pieces, kind of pulling them together into some rigid crystal in order when things cool down. Living things are at some level quite hot. I don't mean hot like the surface of the sun or lava or whatever, but it, it's a matter of comparing the violence of the jiggling to the typical strength of the forces holding them together. There are lots of things that we're made out of where they are capable of bonding together, but they're constantly breaking apart because the forces that are acting on them are strong enough to take them apart. So living things are very dynamic in this way where they're constantly changing their configuration and sort of sticking together and coming apart. And yet somehow at the same time, they're still highly organized, meaning that if you compare a living thing to a random rearrangement of its constituent parts, you know, the, the sort of cartoonish example used in the book is the idea of putting a frog in a blender, which obviously isn't going to go very well for the frog. What that really tells you is that random rearrangements of the constituent parts of little living things are much more numerous. You know, there's there's lots of different ways of randomly rearranging the parts. And there's a very special tiny subset of those arrangements that you would recognize as being a living thing with all of this form and function relationship. And so at some level, you still have this problem of a statistical physicist of explaining how do these molecules that seemingly each on their own are pretty dumb and just flying around and subject to seemingly quasi random forces, why would they collect together into this very exquisitely organized special state? And that now requires an explanation that can't be just, as I said, about the attractive interactions. And it has to be what's called non-equilibrium self-organization. And so the new part of the picture that has to open up is that it's about how the pattern of the energy flowing through the system ends up helping the matter in the system to get organized into a pattern that has a kind of well-matched response to the pattern of the force. So. It's sort of like organization or pattern or structure in the source of energy brings about the possibility of a responsive organization and pattern in the matter in the system, because it turns out from the same kind of physics that you could use to explain the formation of ice, you can also end up coming up with an explanation for why particular pattern organized structures are more stable or more likely to be found by the exploration of combinations of their building blocks under a broad range of circumstances. So I think that's the first chunk of installment. I know I've been talking a lot, so maybe I should give you a chance to, to respond to that. But I, I, I could add a bit more because I know I haven't gotten all the way to the finish line yet. No, that's. I think that's a really great introduction to sort of equilibrium, non-equilibrium um, thermodynamics. And I want to uh, kind of focus on the point you made so statist about statistical mechanics being inherently probabilistic. Um, and so in the book, in your chapter, River and Blood, you give an example of how there's a tiny chance all the air molecules in this room could compactly kind of fit into one corner of the room or that air molecules will actually give energy to a cannonball flying through the air, but they often don't, the probability is so small. Um, and I kind of want to get your interpretation of this probability and randomness. Um, would you say in your opinion, statistical mechanics is in a sense, just as probabilistic as quantum mechanics? Um, Einstein you know, famously said, God does not play dice with the universe in criticism of quantum mechanics. He didn't like the probabilistic nature of all of it. Um, so how should we interpret this randomness and is your perspective on this informed by your faith at all? Okay, so probably we should break that into a few parts. So on the on the one hand, uh, I would say uh, statistical mechanics, just to give people a little sense of background, in principle, 
it, it doesn't, the randomness that you talk about in statistical mechanics doesn't necessarily have to do with the randomness we, we often associate with quantum theory, uh, in that quantum theory supposes that even if you have the maximum control that you could attain, according to physical laws, over some tiny piece of the world, it still could be the case that if you try to measure certain things about that little piece of the world, that every time you do the experiment, you get a different sample from some random range of possibilities. And so you never can quite pin down, you know, what the uh, a, a, a situation where everything you could possibly want to measure about that tiny little piece of the world always is determined. Uh, in, in the picture of statistical mechanics, you can construct the idea of statistical mechanics even by imagining a world where the constituent parts all behave deterministically according to these very well-defined, you know, Newton's laws, kind of cannonballs flying through the air sort of rules. But there are just so many things and you have so much ignorance about what most of them are doing and also the way that they tend to interact when they all sort of bounce, start colliding with each other, bouncing off each other, ends up being so chaotic and difficult to predict, even if you have total knowledge of the initial condition, that it ends up being necessary to have a mathematical formalism where you try to sort of trace out most of what you don't know about the world, and you try to make a model of what you're focused on that contains some partial predictability in like the forces acting or whatever, but then also contains a part that you assume comes from some random distribution. Like I, you know, if I if I take a little pollen grain and put it in water and watch it under a microscope, you know, this is the classic experiment or observation that led to the discovery of what's called Brownian motion. You can see little random motions that this tiny object is making in, sitting in the water. And the understanding of what that's coming from is really just lots of water molecules are bouncing off of it and jolting it in little different directions. And when you add that all up, it just looks like partly it's doing a sort of random walk. So part of the picture of statistical mechanics is that, but in principle, that could just be because you don't know what all the water molecules are doing that are bouncing off the pollen grain. And you, you sort of step away, you give up, and you just make a model of the system that presumes that there's a certain amount of uh, randomness that you have to deal with because you don't know. And now you still try to make predictions about what you can predict. So. There, there's a sidebar, which is, I think that actually quantum theory's special notion of randomness is not so easy to decouple from the classical randomness um, that we often talk about in statistical mechanics, but it's a bit of a technical point. So we can return to it if, if there's time and people want. Um, so now the question is, you know, what does that have to do with dissipative adaptation? And, and what does that have to do uh, maybe with a perspective on the world that sees, for, for example, the hand of God in the world and, and nonetheless is trying to you know model things as, as being random. So those are two kind of forks in the road. I think I, I, I'll try to dust up the, the physics side first. So uh, the, the point is that in the end, just as you would when you're talking about forming ice, whatever, when you're talking about a non-equilibrium system where you have some energy source, you know, like you're shining light on the system at some frequency, you're banging on it you know, with some periodicity, you know, of a certain timing, or you're feeding chemicals of a certain structure into the system and letting other chemicals come out the other side, you're driving the system in some way, there's like a battery that you're using to power it. Those are the scenarios uh, that we're interested in if we're talking about non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. And we're still interested in asking, okay, what's the probability of this happening versus the probability of that happening? And when you think like a statistical mechanician, you have to think about everything that could happen having some finite probability, but it might be that some things are so unlikely you don't worry about them so much. And you're really interested in comparing the things that have relative likelihood that that's worth talking about. Uh, and so uh, there is something kind of funny about writing down equations and then being like, well, I could in principle compute the probability of freakishly crazy, unlikely events happening. But clearly, you know, my theory is interested mostly in the relative likelihood of various things that could happen and you know why one of them wins out. But now you start to see a little bit how this starts to resemble when we talk about evolution, because if I start you know, with a bacterium and I wait a really long time and I let evolution happen you know, in the primordial soup and it keeps on going and things, you, know, you have Darwinian selection and I wait a billion years, however longer, now you could start to say, well, what's more likely in this ocean? Am I gonna have a whale or am I gonna have, I don't know, a gorilla, right? Um, and we take for granted that, you know, we, we see certain outcomes in a certain environment, 
And that they make a certain kind of sense uh, from the Darwinian perspective, because there's this history of how they've been selected at points in their past, where once you have parents giving rise to offspring, and some of those offspring survive and reproduce, and some of them don't, and you keep on iterating on that, you have the possibility of all these different histories being kind of clipped off, and the ones that are more likely to keep on going have to do with the forms that emerge that, that from, from somewhat random processes that are going to help you to survive and help you to reproduce, et cetera. So that whole argument in, the, in Darwinian terms makes sense. And we don't usually think of it exactly in these terms, but this is really still about what's the likelihood of various outcomes of that random process after a long time. But in order to talk in those terms, we have to talk about self-copying things and you know we already have the the chicken or the egg and then we you know can go like gangbusters and, and produce biological diversity. It turns out that if you widen the field of view and think of things more in the language of physics, uh, then you you definitely can still think in terms of various histories, various trajectories that the system could take. And looking at long times about, you know, why is this outcome going to be more or less likely than that outcome? It's still the case that there's an account you can give of why certain outcomes are more likely because of their typical history. Like, what's the typical history that would produce this outcome? Even if you don't have self-copying things, right? So you don't get to make exactly the Darwinian argument, but in physical terms, the argument you end up making, and this is why you know it ends up being about every life is on fire, that it's about sort of energy flow through the system and which kinds of flows of energy are gonna disrupt structure and which kinds are gonna sort of help a structure persist, uh, that there are these moments in the history where matter is gonna undergo changes in shape. And those changes in shape that it can undergo are gonna be related to the access that it has to energy from its environment. So energy is just motion or the potential for motion. And if I'm in a particular shape, then depending on what my environment is like, I maybe can or can't get lots of energy from my environment. And then when I do get energy from the, my environment, that actually is gonna help activate a, a hunk of matter to change its shape. And so you don't have parents and children in the Darwinian argument, but what you have that's the core of the dissipative adaptation argument, which is a more general physical framework that contains the, the Darwinian case, is you have all these moments where you have a hunk of matter, you have possible sources of energy or food or whatever you want to call it in the environment, and the shape you're in both controls your access to energy in the environment, and then also therefore controls when and how you get to change your shape. And if you keep iterating on that, you change your shape in a way that's related to how your shape receives energy from the environment, and now you're in a new shape, and that new shape receives energy differently from the environment, and you keep on iterating on that, you can also see selection principles that start to hold in terms of the likelihood at long time that you're in a particular shape that has a particular special relationship with the source of energy that's in its environment. Like, for example, a glass that might resonate very well with the source of energy in that environment and therefore absorb more energy from it because the particular shape is good at oscillating at a particular frequency. Or the opposite of that, because you also can have cases where you have something that's recognizably recognizably very bad at absorbing energy from a source in the environment because everything that was good at absorbing that energy absorbed so much that it got shattered. And now you're just left with matter that is selected to be very stable in a certain state because it's very bad at absorbing energy from the patterns in its surroundings. Thanks. Great explanation. Especially, I can, I, I'm really fascinated by your explanation of how Darwinian evolution is sort of a special case of, of this. And maybe we can get into that more later if people are interested. Um, I kind of want to zoom out from, from the technical discussion and uh, look at how throughout the book you interweave language of the Bible with mathematical language of physics. Um, and you even make this interesting point about language where you say that our own role in giving names to the phenomenon of the world actually precedes our ability to say with clarity what it means to call something alive. And this is this kind of, to me, a striking connection with, um, you know, the book of Genesis, where it, in, in chapter one, verse three, it says, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Um, so we see language preceding creation. And so I kind of want to ask you about this. What's, what's the purpose and value of language, both qualitative and then quantitative as a physicist, to describe essentially the same thing, um, 
in, in terms of discussing life? Yeah, I, I think that definitely is a question that's central to the story of, of how the book originated in that I think as I grew up as a physicist and a biologist, you know, I, I even as an undergraduate was interested in both subjects. I like theoretical physics, and I was also fascinated by living things and sort of what made them tick. Um, and trying to do something on the boundary always attracted me. And I think well into my studies and even, you know, into graduate school um, and, and completing my PhD, I was aware in general of the idea that there was the potential to understand something more about what life was or how it worked using physics. But I don't think I'd ever been taught by anyone that physics and biology are really two separate languages for talking about the same world. And interestingly, I think that one of the things that helped me to realize that um, was the kind of dose of philosophical clarity I got from studying the early passages in the book of Genesis. Uh, that, as you alluded, uh, this, this idea of, you know, God said, let there be light and, and there was light. I really think there's a point uh, summarized very well in that verse in modern philosophical parlance by a statement made by Ludwig Wittgenstein in the 20th century, the borders of my language are the borders of my world. Like the recognition somehow that the choice of how you break the world into different pieces, the taxonomy you develop, you know, how you resolve the edges of the patchwork, that that's actually a choice by the person who's trying to make a model of the sort of full fabric of what they observe and experience. And there are different ways of, of divvying that up and dividing it up. And, you know, that's how you develop different languages that are for engaging with perhaps the same system in different ways. And, and I really think just the idea of, as you say, uh, speech preceding creation, at some level, there's a point in there that the light by which we see the world comes in part from the way that we talk about it. And so we can choose to come to the world and say, these are electrons and that's DNA, et cetera. Or we could come to the same world and say, that is land and that is sea and those are fish and those are birds. And it's not necessarily productive to imagine that when we're finally done just deciding what language we're going to use, that there will be only one and it will be equally suitable for covering all the different kinds of phenomena we want to talk about. And certainly at, at this stage in the development of science, and I, I, I would assert that I think this is really a requirement in a sense of, of doing science well or, or relating successfully to all that's predictable about the world, you have different languages that grab onto different things. So physics fundamentally uh, is really about measurement, uh, quantification, distance, time, quantifying an amount of substance and trying to establish empirical and then ultimately theoretically describable relationships between those quantities. So, you know, you can measure how tall a building is and you can drop a cat off the top of the building in the tradition of physicists endangering cats in their thought experiments. Um, and you can ask how fast the cat is moving when it hits the ground. Uh, and that's a physics question, notwithstanding the fact that you're using a cat in your experiment. And then you can ask also, all right, is the cat alive or dead afterwards? Uh, and I think that while it's the case that we all appreciate that how fast the cat is moving when it hits the ground somehow affects the answer to that question, it will never be the case that asking whether the cat is alive or dead is the same thing as asking some quantity that you could measure uh, uh, about you know, how fast it's moving. Or, uh, I mean, maybe if you count the number of pieces the cat is in, it starts to be a very reliable proxy for what's alive. But my claim would be that really, when we are talking in terms of life and death, that we're coming from a qualitative perspective that gives birth to biology that doesn't really require any quantification at all, although it may benefit from it if you want to do more sophisticated things. So the, the foundation of biological thinking is, I know this is alive. This is a tree or this is a frog or whatever. I know this rock is not alive. I know this sand is not alive. And then now I'm interested in, you know, what's going to cause this frog to be more or less alive or more or less healthy. And then I can do all sorts of empirical experiments about that. There's nothing inherently numerical in that, whereas there is in physics. And I think the clarity of that understanding is something that really helped me to start thinking uh, what ultimately felt to me to be more successfully about biophysics when I was trying to work it through in my postdoc what I wanted to work on. Uh, and, and that, I think, wasn't a given from 
how I'd been taught to think about things as a scientist, but I think it really did come a bit from realizing more generally that there are different languages with which you can talk about the world, some of which are scientists are using and some of which they aren't. But, but to be able to say, okay, even if you're a scientist, are you talking about this in the language of physics or are you talking like a biologist? What that poses for you is that, oh, okay, so if I want to address living things as a physicist would, then I need to realize that physics isn't going to tell me what's alive. It's going to put a different frame of description on a system that could be alive or could be not alive. And now I can start to think about all the examples of what I know is alive, all the examples of what I know is not alive, and what would actually be the de physical description of crossing the boundary between them. And then maybe I'll start to understand some things about you know, the, the, the physical properties that are most distinctive of life and be able to make clear physical theories of them because I'm talking physics the whole time and I understand what I'm doing. Yeah, great. And especially kind of this discussion of, you know, physics can't quantify what's alive. You write in the book, like, you know, from a physics perspective, death is not, nothing more than sliding downhill in a variety of physical and chemical ways. Um, and sort of looking at descriptions like that and really quantitative descriptions of life and death, um, it can leave one feeling that all life is, is a series of sort of equations and numbers. Um, and so my question is kind of how can we, and how do you personally um, derive meaning from life or maintain faith that life has greater meaning, faith in God, when your job is to study sort of the reduction of life to these seemingly empty quantitative descriptions? So I think that that question is, is particularly uh, important because it's it's clearly one that is in dialogue with a lot of rhetoric you hear, you know, uh, in, in the broader world that sometimes I think people come in with the assumption that it must actually be the case that everything that's true about something fundamentally is most true when described in the language that a scientist or particularly a physicist would use. There's very successful branding for talking about the world like a physicist does in this day and age. And so people say, oh, yeah, exactly what you just said, that when you put the, the sort of physicist glasses on and look at the world in that way, using that language, using that methodology, then it does just sort of look like, oh, this is all just marbles bouncing off of each other and rolling up and down. And the table is made of these marbles and this person is made of these marbles, but physics doesn't a priori recognize you know, greater meaning or importance of you know in any kind of difference between the table and the person. So then maybe the fundamental language for all the truth about the world doesn't recognize that difference. So it's an illusion and there is no difference. And yeah, it, it, it definitely, if you keep the, the physics classes on the whole time, uh, then you're going to feel a kind of despondency and meaninglessness in, in, in what you behold. And, and I, I think there are various people, again, who kind of speak uh, in the language of popular science to the general public where they, they point to that problem. But I think maybe uh, usually almost kind of argue for the despondency or, or maybe don't offer much of a, a solution to it. And I think that the, the mistake that they're often making is that they forget that physics, the activity of physics is actually all something that people made up, which doesn't mean it's not useful or true in some sense, but it's, a, it's an activity that is the artisanship of the human being in, in trying to provide a summary of what seems predictable about the world in certain terms. So you start with the world in general and your experience of the world, and then you start to say, okay, what are things I can do to start talking about what is usefully predictable about this world? And you, you end up at that trailhead having to make a choice of how you talk about it. And one way of making a lot of progress as humanity is discovered is by saying, let me start measuring a lot of things and I'll be you know, very careful and meticulous in how I look at what kinds of mathematical relationships end up presenting themselves between these different measurements that I can make. And we forget that that frame was not the only frame that we could put on the world. That's not the only choice that we could make about what language to use. And, and we then go further and we become so fascinated and even awed by the power of the predictions that we can make with that language that we start to say, maybe this is all there is, or you know, maybe everything else that I think might be true about the world is like some illusion. And at the bottom, it's all actually these numbers. But the numbers never, never stop being 
things of our own devising, right? And I think Wittgenstein, again, looking for a modern philosopher who would, you know, uh, I'd say agree agree with this at least by the end of his career. Um, <clears throat> you 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 never get past the fact that these are theoretical constructions of the human being, even if they work really well. So all physical laws that we know are really human inventions that could be improved over time. They could be changed over time. But even if some things are, you know, we're pretty confident about, our couching of those in language is still our own devising and our own construction. And if you look at it that way, the point is you can go back to the trailhead and say, what other languages are there with which I could talk about the same world? And you, rem you remind yourself that even if you're trying to be scientific, you know, there's you could be a biologist, you could be an economist, you really need more than one language to get after, you know, to, 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 to get at everything uh, that you might be going after in the world, because the Schrodinger equation, you know, quantum mechanics, whatever, that's not really going to help you with the stock market. Um, it's mostly irrelevant to helping you with, I don't know, trying to cure cancer or something like that. Um, and, and, and so you really have these different levels of description. And some of those levels of description, um, you know, are just different ones that you could devise yourself. But I think the point is that there's always for an individual person, the question of which commitment to make in terms of like, what's my fundamental description? Where, where am I really planting my feet? And it's not just about, can I predict things? It's also about, you know, what should I do? Uh, it's also about, you know, whom am I talking to? What kinds of projects am I trying to make myself a part of? And I think the point is that scientific thinking doesn't sweep all of that aside. It's really just that you can choose to ignore all of that if you want, because you're fascinated by science. But that doesn't actually mean that science has sort of proven that those other activities get you no traction in the world, right? There are other kinds of predictive speech uh, that are not necessarily based in physics. Uh, there's prophetic speech, you know, for example, in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, and, and that way of talking about the world, like saying, for example, uh, that uh, something is going to happen because it is the judgment of the creator of the world that it should happen, you know, if people make this choice or if they make this other choice, um, then things will go a different way. That's a completely different frame to put on experience, but that doesn't mean that you can't, from your experience as an individual or as a nation, discover that there is a kind of traction to that way of talking as well. And so I think the point is that meaning in our experience is ultimately to be found if we seek it, if we make some kind of covenant, some kind of agreement to participate with other people and with God in a, an, a set of activities that uh, propel you to assign meaning to things by, by sharing what things mean with those other people and, and having a language that you used to talk about what's happening and saying, this is righteousness and this is murder and you know all, all those different kinds of categorizations. They don't flow from the physical description, but they are other descriptions of what's happening in the world that you can insist on filling your speech with and, and sharing with others. And if you do enough of that, um, I, I don't think that that stands somehow on a less solid foundation uh, than the activities uh, physicists is usually engaged in. Yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah, a lot of really rich ideas there. Um, as we have about 20 minutes left, I'm going to invite people uh, who are watching if they want to submit questions uh, while I ask you sort of uh, another question. So feel free to start thinking, sending in questions you want to ask Jeremy. Um, I kind of on this idea of um, science being a tool for us to kind of measure this partly predictable world, which is language that you use in an article you published. Um, I kind of want to ask you about this idea of miracles that you talk about in, in throughout the book. So um, Moses in the burning bush throwing the staff on the ground and turning into a snake, um, sort of uh, things of that nature and his, his snowy skin. Um, I'm really fascinated by this question of, um, you know, are miracles things that we as humans perceive uh, to violate the natural laws of the universe as we've defined them? Or uh, kind of in your view, are they things that, you know, maybe it's just something we wouldn't have expected or predicted, but is perfectly um, viable for to happen kind of within the laws of nature? Um, very big question, but curious your perspective on that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so that question is one where the answer 
I would try to give is definitely going to be rooted in the my understanding from the Judaic sources, so the Hebrew Bible and the Talmud and you know those kinds of commentaries. And so the word miracle may mean something else to someone else, depending on you know how they're using it and what tradition they're coming from. But uh, when I look at the you know the Hebrew word for it, nes, and you know what are examples of nisim, which is the plural of nes, uh, that are are understood. Uh, in, you know, for example, the book of Genesis or book of Exodus, like the splitting of the sea is maybe the archetypal moment, you know, where Moses and the Israelites are stuck at the edge of the Sea of Reeds and Pharaoh is coming with his army to kill them and the sea splits and they walk through and Pharaoh's army drowns. And so that's the, the ultimate moment where it seems like, okay, something that is impossible is happening and that, that has a, it has a, a sort of a function in the narrative. I think that from such a distant remove over time, and when we look at that moment, you know, reading the Hebrew Bible, we read it with so much baggage of how people now often think about the world from what we've learned from natural science, where we think fundamentally what the world is, is this kind of maybe partly deterministic and partly totally quantumly random mechanism that has these laws that it has to operate by, which are called the natural laws or the physical laws. And then when things that are impossible happen, it's because someone kind of got to press pause on those laws and, and broke them in a way that there can, be no, there, there can be no explanation for. And that's what's called a miraculous occurrence. And it's equally a miraculous occurrence if it happens in some way that, I don't know, uh, is, is ripped out of the pages of the, of the book of Exodus, so to speak, or also if it happens in a freakish and comical way with no purpose, like in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy or something, where there's some sort of uh, a pointless and, and comical aspect to it, but the, the, the significant thing is that something freakishly improbable and impo impossible happened, um, where some physical laws kind of got broken. And I think that that's, that's kind of a, a, a confused way of talking about what these things are supposed to mean. Uh, when, when, you, when you make a real study of what, what is the concept of the ness, of, of the miracle, as understood in the Hebrew Bible, because Really, the, you know, and this, you know, you alluded to this in your question. Really, the fundamental thing is about the perspective of the observer and the one who experiences something, and the expectations we have, because there's this fundamental understanding, you know, and this this has to do with other answers, you know, to other questions we were talking through. The perspective of the Bible is very interested in how the world seems from the perspective of a human being, right? So. It might be that things are made of lots of little atoms or whatever, but we don't experience that. We experience mud. We experience, you know, snakes and sticks. It's going to talk to us in terms that are at our level and how we experience life in the world. And we also experience life in the world always facing radical uncertainty about what's going to happen. Like with all the progress we've made in science, I still don't know if I'm going to miss or catch a bus that I want to get tomorrow until it actually happens. And that's because every instant that we live through is actually this uncontrolled particular set of things that are converging to produce the event. Uh, and you can't really make a science out of one instant in time. You need reproducibility. You need a controlled setting to really talk about uh, you know, reproducible, uh, testable laws. So we can form expectations based on both physical laws that we know and also rules of thumb that help us get through life. And at the end of the day, those expectations might turn out to be true when things happen, or they might turn out to be very much not what happens. You know, and that's why God says to Moses at the burning bush, I will be what I will be, right? That he's identifying himself as the decider of what happens and saying, look, until I decide what happens, you don't actually know. And sometimes you're going to be right and sometimes you're not going to be right. And that enters into this, this emblem, actually, the staff and the serpent, becomes the center of the discussion again, because that sign is given to Moses, because Moses is saying, how do I convince the people that I'm going to go to in Egypt that I'm coming with a message from the creator of the world? And from one standpoint, it looks like it's just a parlor trick, like, okay, throw a stick on the ground, it turns into a serpent, everyone will be really impressed. But what we have to recognize is that, first of all, later in the story, the this, this sorcerers of Pharaoh also throw sticks on the ground and turn them into reptiles. And so that's kind of showing you how shallow that is if all this is about is just dazzling people with a trick. And, and then the question is, what's the difference in the case of, of Moses? What's really happening there? And the point is you have this staff, 
which is this metrical, controllable, inanimate object with no agency of its own, where you can hold it and make the other end do what you want because you're pushing on one end of it, um, and where uh, you uh, can perhaps uh, relate to the world in a sense as being built up out of a bunch of things that have all these metrical and inanimate properties. Like it's sort of like the physical view, and then you throw it on the ground, and it doesn't become an elephant, which would be another way of making a miracle that's impressive, right? It becomes a serpent. Uh, and, and the point is the serpent is the talking animal of the Bible. So it's really, and it's also the animal that's the most like a stick or, or a staff. So the, the point, therefore, is that it's really a shift in perspective on the same thing. Instead of looking at the world as a bunch of staves, so to speak, as a bunch of metrical, controllable, predictable things, uh, you are going to look at it as a serpent, meaning a holistic thing with agency, you, you can't predict it. It's kind of scary because you don't totally know what it's going to do and it might be dangerous, but it also contains the potential for a voice that speaks, right? Because the serpent, the Nahash, and the, the, the uh, word of the Hebrew Bible that's used there, which is different, by the way, than the reptile that the, the sorcerers create in the court of Pharaoh, the Nahash is the animal of the Garden of Eden that speaks. And so what it's pointing to is this possibility of if you relate to the world as this holistic thing that is not totally predictable to you, and where you don't try to break it into a bunch of metrical things that you can control and predict and that are inanimate and are just sort of utensils in your hand, but you relate to it instead as kind of a, a set of things you can't totally predict that might have a voice that you could listen to, that's a shift in your perspective. And maybe both of those perspectives on the same world are possible. So it's again, this thing of changing your language. And that shift in perspective is the thing that creates the possibility of the recognition of the hand of the world's creator in the events of the world in a way that could have meaning to you because you can't predict everything that will happen. And what that fundamentally demonstrates is that the whole idea of miracle there, it's not about, okay, here the laws of physics were broken, here they weren't. It's about what you expected to happen. And crucially in that moment, whether you were open to seeing some kind of response to a prayer or some kind of answer to a question in a dialogue that you're having with your creator. So that rules out you know, two kinds of things we sometimes associate with miracles, that it's both the case that you don't need it to be the case that anything happens that you would say, oh, that's against the laws of physics, right? The miracle of the Book of Esther is that when you know the, the empire that ruled the entire ancient world at the time resolved to wipe out all of the Jews, uh, that it should have had the power to do that. And miraculously, it failed in a way that no one could have predicted or expected. And that miracle is recorded in the Book of Esther, and there's no splitting of a sea, and there's no you know turning of a stick into a snake. It's just no one would have thought this would happen. And, and we see the deliverance uh, from the hand of the world's creator for the Israelites in that moment. So it's telling you, you know, miracles can happen because of unexpected but perfectly natural things that happen in the life of an individual or the nation. And at the same time, it's also saying that if in the sort of comical fashion of Douglas Adams, you have, you know, uh, a, a sort of violation of the laws of physics or freakish improbability, self-assembling a, a whale, you know, in free fall above the surface of a planet, as happens in, in one of his books, to call that a miracle if no one's there to have a relationship uh, with God that somehow has changed or, or to see meaning in that event because of the context of the narrative that led to that occurrence, that doesn't make sense either, right? That unlikely things or seemingly unlikely things happen all the time, but they aren't all necessarily to be read as messages because, again, the perspective of the one giving the interpretation matters. And if they're not seeking God, then God's not sending them a message. Yeah, great. Um yeah, it's so rich, hard to kind of pick out a specific thing to to discuss, but we have a few questions from the audience that I can see. Um, so this is shifting gears, but someone asks, um, what future research directions are you excited about at the moment? I think there are a number of things that are uh, potentially exciting um, that range from new kinds of ways of computing uh, to understanding things about what living things or biological systems might be doing that we didn't necessarily realize they were capable of doing. So again, the, the fundamental point with the symptom adaptation is without Darwinian selection, you can get 
other kinds of selection in the structure of matter that just has to do with how the pattern in the source of energy in the environment gives rise to a sort of responsive pattern in the organization of the system. So for example, you know, we, we've done simulations and, and then subsequently study this in experiments like the swarm robotics, um, but you, you can make experiments of system, or sorry, you, you, can, you can imagine a system where it's made essentially of a bunch of different atoms that are just sort of rattling around and uh, sticking together and orienting a little arrow on the atom in different directions, which has is kind of like a magnetic moment. So the physical details aren't so important. It's just you imagine a bunch of arrows that can point in different directions and they exert forces on each other in the way that they point. So if I am now tapping on that system with a certain pattern over time, it turns out with everything obeying very simple, dumb physical laws, the system as a whole ends up exhibiting this behavior where the energy that it absorbs over time goes down. But then if you change the pattern with which you're tapping, the energy absorption jumps back up again. And then it goes back down if the pattern stays the same. And then you change the pattern again and the energy absorption jumps back up. And so it's become this kind of novelty detector where it has quote unquote learned what the pattern of its past is. And it has expectations about its future that when you violate those expectations, it exhibits a very detectable behavior. And you didn't program it. It's not a computer. Uh, you didn't carefully control a lot of different pieces of it so that they would instantiate computational roles uh, because their physics is so well controlled. It's a big uncontrolled physical mess, but the simple physics turns out to get you a certain kind of computing behavior that is kind of like machine learning and some things we do in artificial intelligence uh, that just comes from the collective behavior doing something uh, very messy but in a way that is like the mess is interpreting a pattern that you're putting in. And then you can look at the pattern that emerges in what the mess does as a consequence. So one of the exciting things about that in principle is that you don't have to control as many pieces of that system to get it to compute certain kinds of things for you. And that may open up the possibility of harnessing many more computing bits in a sense than you usually can control in a normally engineered computing system. And actually, it's not like quantum computing formally or mathematically, but it parallels that story a little bit in that quantum computing is also a story where you say, oh, if you understand certain aspects of physics, you could design a device where certain kinds of algorithms will actually require you to control fewer pieces of the system carefully, and you'll be able to compute something faster than you expected. So there may also be kind of, let's say, a family of machine learning-like applications where you can do computing with a big mess of atoms that you didn't have to exert control over a priori. And it's just kind of a disordered crystal that you can feed patterns into and then read things out of. So that's one kind of computing application um, that I think we've only looked at in the theoretical realm or some very kind of basic experiments. But I think there may be an interesting kind of engineering application there. And then thinking more in, in terms of biology, uh, and, and this maybe connects more with um, some kinds of experimental collaborations and I'm trying to get going for, with some labs here in Israel, for example. Uh, there's also the question of what kinds of computing behavior might be going on in the background in living things that we don't realize because we assumed that they weren't possible in the mess, right? Like a living cell is a big bag of proteins and every protein there is this big complicated assemblage of atoms that can kind of change its shape sometimes depending on what molecules it's eating and breaking apart or what other molecules are touching it. And so you actually have one of these messes that could compute stuff. And then there are patterned changes in the environment of a living thing. And so I think that the history of biological thinking for a long time has been heavily influenced by the notion of Darwinian selection, where anything that a living thing does that's smart, you kind of assume there must have been some Darwinian past where it was selected in order to be smart in that way because its ancestors survived and reproduced by having some ability to act smart in that fashion. But it may actually be that there are emergent computing behaviors you can get from any bag of proteins that has, you know, fuel flowing in and waste flowing out. Um, and it can sort of self-organize on the fly computing solutions to its problems that the rest of life may, or the rest of the, the living thing may then have been selected to be very good at co-opting and harnessing and making better use of. So uh, there's a more complicated story maybe in, in the molecular biophysics uh, that we could start looking for if we, if we know how to with this kind of a frame.
Thanks. Yeah, that that lends really well to, I'm going to try to kind of tie together a few questions I see in the chat of kind of this idea of learning and the concept of being alive. Um, so you talk about how we're, we're, we're more ready to accept the idea of a computer program or machine learning algorithm learning something than we are like a bag of proteins in a, in a human. Um, and then we can also kind of look at AI systems that we have today, um, like ChatGPT, um, and, and the idea of being able to learn things. Um, I guess my question is how how can we is learning sort of a um something that we should only ascribe to things that are living um and if we give something like you know machine learning or um some of the computational possibilities that we see from this bit of adaptation um this trait of being able to learn does that change where we draw the boundary between something being alive and not alive um, and then are there any kind of broader faith implications about this if we as humans are creating these learning machines um does this is this one person's asked is this sort of like man playing the role of god um in that case so i think the, the narrow discussion of how we use the word learning <clears throat> to me it seems the most important thing is just as is often the case when you're doing science in general don't forget which language you're currently speaking in a way that might allow you to play fast and loose and kind of change which language you're speaking without others being aware of it so that you can seem to have come to an interesting conclusion or is in fact you just kind of played a shell game because people do that sometimes you know when talking about like the science of consciousness and the science of um things to do with the boundary of, of life and non-life i think that you could relate to the idea of learning behaviorally and just say look i have this box or i have this collection of atoms or whatever and what i mean by learning is just that I have some target for an input-output behavior uh, that I myself might find useful or that might impress me in some way because it's difficult for me to do, but somehow the experience of what I show to the system in terms of stimuli can produce ultimately a set of behaviors that are somehow successful by some standard that I've set. That's how machine learning works, for example. Like when we use the term in that way, we're saying we've made a computer algorithm where we just keep on changing the parameters of the algorithm until it is a function of input to output that has the useful property we want it to have. Like for example, that you can feed in, in numerical form, the image of a cat or a dog, and it can tell you this is a cat or this is a dog. But that kind of learning is formally defined within a framework, either you know where you're doing this with lumps of atoms, like I was talking about, you know, and, and, and you know, the sort of novelty detection example, or, you know, with an algorithm that you're trying to use that you've implemented on a computer. Uh, but what would be unfair is to be like, okay, so now that we define learning in that behavioral way, we'll talk about it as though, look, I got this thing to learn. And that's the same thing as when, you know, a kindergartner is being taught reading comprehension or something. And that's also an example of learning. Clearly, we've done a huge bait and switch there in terms of how we're using the word. And people, I think, still maybe are tempted to say, but well, we don't really understand enough yet about how the brain works. And so maybe there are aspects of the way that people learn that are not, if you look at the guts of what they're doing, you know, with the molecules and the atoms and the cells or whatever that are involved, maybe there is not such a huge difference between what some aspects of what I'm doing when I recognize a cat um, you know, is going on and maybe what an algorithm that we made that takes pictures of cats and recognizes them uh, is doing. So th that that could well be the case. And yet still, when we say learning and we're talking about people, we know what it means very well from inside the experience of people as social beings. And we, I think, still understand very little about how much of that maps onto some of the primitive behavioral versions of learning that don't involve linguistic exchange between people um, that we can make in like an algorithm or you know a, a physical experiment or whatever. We don't understand how much of human learning has in common with that and how much it doesn't. And so I think I would first and foremost just advocate for caution about not assuming that just because you could use the word in two different sentences that are really in two different languages that it's fair to jump from one to the other. And remembering when you're talking about something kind of narrow and behavioral versus something that really comes from its original definition in a human context. And that may 
mean that you know we're still a long way from you know being able to fill in all the blanks and what chat gpt is doing i think we know algorithmically is certainly not how a person decides how to finish a sentence in all regards but it may be that there's some you know aspects of this probabilistic ad living that is also part of what we do as well um and uh indeed it, you know it's also true that language requires partial predictability you know this is the thing we got back to before with like the staff and the serpent and then maybe I'll, I'll try to use that to, 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 to expand back to you know the, the the final aspect of the question you're asking about um playing god or you know, finding god in the world and well, what it means to you know be learning about the world in such a way that the world might contain a message so i i think one of the things uh that is interesting about the staff and serpent example and and the need in a sense for unpredictability to be at the center of uh, the idea of experiencing something that seems to you like it's a message from the creator of the world that was meant for you uh, is that the world has to be partly predictable and partly unpredictable for that to work. Uh, because if the world is totally predictable, then that means you know everything I'm going to say before I say it, and there's no communication that can happen. But if the world is totally unpredictable, then there's no medium for language. And you can demonstrate that to yourself with a kind of chat GPT-like example, right? There's actually a lot that you could, quote unquote, and now you have to fill in the blank. The word I'm going for is guess. There's a lot that you could guess about what I'm going to say next from the context of what I already said, but you still don't know exactly what I'm going to say until I say it. And, and that balance point between total unpredictability where there's no grammar, no syntax, everything is just noise, and total predictability where there's no communication, that's where some kind of dialogue can happen, some kind of communication can happen. Uh, and that is you know, part of the point that's being made by this association of the miraculous serpent appearing with the notion that there's a voice that you, know, you could hear meaning from. Uh, and, and so I think that there's definitely a lot of moments in the narratives, particularly in the book of Genesis, that try to point out that an individual has the opportunity to relate to experience as though to some degree they are kind of trying to uh, take the empirical data of experience and, and notice when uh, the unpredictability kind of causes blanks to be filled in in ways that were surprisingly matched to their, their prayers or their hopes or their expectations or their good deeds or their bad deeds or whatever else and, and and put an interpretive frame on that that forms the basis for meaning in a relationship with God that we learn you know from a text that we trust in to help us find that and 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 that's you know how that whole story is supposed to work but then the question is also you know is there something about behaving in that way um that is sort of acting like your God you know which is something you just alluded to and I think from a Judaic perspective, the answer would be yes, but that's not necessarily a problem. Like I think we have from the Greeks this notion of trying to be like the gods, that it's something that never succeeds and is punished because it's hubris, it's this kind of arrogance. And it's certainly true that humility before God is a central idea in the text of the Hebrew Bible as well, but that doesn't mean we're not supposed to try to imitate God with humility. Right. And and so the whole idea of being made in the image of God, which is, you know, again, early passages in Genesis that's telling us about that, is that at some level, it's this invitation to say, OK, God creates things and names things. And what's special about me as a human being? What distinguishes me uh, from uh, all the other living or partly living or non-living things in the world is that I, too, can create things and name things. And now what am I supposed to do with that capacity? Uh, and so. Well, when we take that into the sort of 21st century and we start talking about creating things that can learn, obviously there are a lot of dizzying questions, uh, you know, about what that means. And, and I think there, uh, I wouldn't say that there's some kind of blanket prohibition on making anything that looks like it's learning it all because then you're playing God and you will be punished for that. I, I, would, I would rather say maybe that the... The, the, the way the Hebrew Bible would, would attack that question in contradistinction to maybe the sort of more Hellenic, like don't have hubris kind of warning uh, about that kind of activity would be to say instead that we are on the one hand with humility 
with the right relationship with God and his expectations of us as beings with moral limitations on how they act and what they seek to accomplish, you know, we're invited to try to imitate him with our capacities. And perhaps that could involve making things that are good at learning in some way. However, there is a temptation to something that the Bible calls idolatry, which is to try to make something that's like a person that we ultimately want to worship, right? That if we, if our ultimate goal in making something that learns is to create something that will be smarter than we are so that we can somehow uh, retreat from moral responsibility and substitute uh, the sort of supposedly greater knowledge or power of what we've created with our own hands uh, uh, for our own uh, attempts to judge what God wants of us, that way lies danger. But I think there it's it's not so much because it's hubris, but more because it's it's about the ever present human craving for uh, the opportunity to have this more tangible, direct relationship with God that comes from having really created a replacement for God that we sort of control and at the same time sort of want to uh, put ahead of us and have it tell us what to do. <laughs> and so that's a very complex discourse in the Bible, and so you can't really um, uh, cover the whole discussion on one leg. Uh, but I, I think that would be the the, the first um, thing I'd say on that topic. Yeah, thanks. That was great. And and I think, yeah, really interesting, probably could talk for a lot longer about that idea you bring up at the end of idolatry, especially. It reminds me of like Exodus 32, the story of the golden calf and how, you know, maybe to some extent, these learning kind of things that we've become fascinated with, chat GPT, AI, um, we kind of, you know, place before ourselves as, as a sort of golden calf and kind of key to, to life. And we maybe start to um, idolize these ideas of learning um machines so yeah a discussion for another time um but yeah i get we've kind of gone over our time now um i just kind of wanted to thank you so much for this great conversation um i think for me one of the the kind of greatest takeaways from this book is this idea of different languages speaking about the world both through kind of a biblical lens and through a lens of physics and the idea that the two are by no means incompatible um and also we can learn kind of more from each of them so I yeah I want to give you a, a chance if you have any final words anything you want to leave the the audience with. No, I I, I all I should say at this point is thank you uh, also for the opportunity and for wonderful questions uh, and a wonderful dialogue. I think we we covered a lot of ground. Yeah, <laughs> hoping I probably can't solve you know all of the questions of miracles and um, you know idolization and learning, but I think we had a good stab at it. So yeah, thanks everyone so much for for watching and yeah, hopefully talk, talk again soon. Take care.